So I try to make a professional habit of struggling out loud. To be as often as possible what my dear Buddhist friend Grace Gilliam calls publicly vulnerable. Public vulnerability. And I try to do this for a few reasons. The first, in a purely personal way, it relieves my anxiety to name stuff out loud. Anybody else in the room like that? If you could name it, all of a sudden it doesn't have so much power, right? Um, the second reason is that when we name things aloud, we give others who might be struggling with similar things the gift of knowing that they're not alone. And the third is that being vulnerable is a great spiritual practice, one that Jesus engaged with regularity throughout his life, one that always strikes me incredibly beautiful when other people do it, and one that always takes me to the precipice of powerlessness and strength in this life and shows me how interconnected they are. I actually think the practice of vulnerability can save our world from violence in particular. Like there's actual salvation every time we practice vulnerability. I believe this. So having said all that, I want to be vulnerable with you before we dive into this passage from Matthew. Earlier this week, like on Tuesday, when I came back from my honeymoon, I saw um, what scripture was chosen for this Sunday, and I told Tom Ryberg that I was going to choose another text, because this is my least favorite passage in the entire New Testament. For reasons that I'll get into in a little bit, this text makes it hard for me to write and deliver a feel-good sermon. And believe it or not, I actually want y'all to walk out of here feeling loved and nurtured and, yes, challenged, but more than anything, I want you to feel seen and understood and touched by grace. And for these reasons, I wanted to avoid Matthew 28, 16 through 20. But T.R. and all of his uh, pastoral and prophetic wisdom wasn't going to let me avoid the hard stuff. No, he said. You can't just preach the stuff you like and avoid everything else. It's bad modeling for our people. And besides, how many right-wing churches are still preaching this passage every Sunday in ways that lead to the very stuff you detest? and yet progressives aren't touching it, which means we allow the right-wing interpretation to prevail and stand alone in the world. Good colleague, that guy. Hmm? He holds me accountable to our tradition and to progressive commitment. And if you get nothing else from this sermon, get this. Every single one of us needs a colleague or a friend or a companion that will do both of those things. Someone who will hold us accountable to our tradition and our progressive commitments. I am lucky to have TR in my life. I wish the same for you, and my hope for this sermon is that I will hold us accountable to our tradition and our progressive commitments in ways that keep us rooted in God's truth and moving towards God's justice. But before we go there, I want to dedicate this sermon to Tom Ryberg for never letting me off the hook. And I also want to dedicate this sermon to Monique Savage, who some of you know. She reminded me powerfully and beautifully a few months back that when it comes to issues of oppression, liberation, accountability, and spiritual humility, to struggle is to honor, and to honor is to struggle. In struggling to honor a people, the struggle itself is a form of honor. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the struggle with this text be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our liberator. Amen. 
The story we just heard Nathan read is the close, the very end to Matthew's gospel. It is a short four-verse conclusion to Matthew's telling of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The concluding words of this text are known as the Great Commission. Though I would argue for some folks in the world, the Great Commission is considered anything and everything but great. More on that in a minute. I want to spend some time engaging seriously with what Edward Said brings to our attention, the thing that Lissa just read, the intersection of cultural texts and imperialism. When I say the word imperialism, here is what I mean. The practice, theory, and attitudes of domination enacted geographically and culturally wherein one territory acquires economic, strategic, and political power over another. Do I need to read that again? Yes, okay. The practice, theory, and attitudes of domination enacted geographically and culturally wherein one territory acquires economic, strategic, and political power over another. This mandate to Jesus to go make disciples of all nations is only cited in Matthew's gospel, and it may or may not have been literally said by Jesus, and if it was, it was originally directed at the 11 disciples minus Judas. But if there was ever a biblical passage that's been taken literally and taken personally and taken globally, it's this one. There is no doubt that Christian evangelism, the work of international missionaries sent forth from Europe and North America in particular, and imperialism have gone hand in hand for a large part of history with an acceleration of conquest and colonialism happening in the 18 and 1900s. Missionaries often use these words from Matthew's gospel, this charge to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them obedience as their motivation for foreign mission and evangelism. In her groundbreaking book, Postcolonial Feminist Interpretation of the Bible, African biblical scholar Dr. Musa Dube quotes a story that's been passed down orally in sub-Saharan Africa for years. When the white man came to our country... He had the Bible, and we had the land. The white man said, let us pray. After the prayer, the white man had the land, and we had the Bible. To read this text today, here, in an explicitly progressive church that promises to take the Bible and history seriously is to inherit the truth of Christianity's role in the colonialism of the Americas, Australia, and parts of Asia and Africa. I am talking about stealing and exploitation of land, the wiping away of languages and cultures and religions, the rape of indigenous women and children by colonizers, the enslavement of indigenous people for the sake of economic profit by invaders. I am talking about takeover, power over, domination that has hurt the earth and hurt people so wide and so deep it simply cannot be contained in words or in a sermon. I'm talking about a dynamic that persists today whenever any country or culture or community anywhere is arrogant enough to think its way is the highway and uses its ideological superiority complex to invade, conquer, and exploit. Our recent and current occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan smell mighty close to this dynamic. So lest we think I'm talking about an imperial dynamic that happened long ago, I'm not. This dynamic also gets enacted in a neighborhood revitalization project also known as gentrification when a city program or a group of individuals move long-term residents out in order to bring new improved real estate and businesses and hipstery families into the neighborhood. This is happening all over Michigan, but most painfully in Detroit, and yes, here in Battle Creek. And this is a dynamic that's, again, rooted in arrogance. It's our way is the way, and we are, therefore, justified in moving in, teaching our stuff, erasing your stuff, and making you obey. 
And this dynamic has been and still is almost always perpetuated by the wealthy on the poor and by light-skinned people on darker-skinned people. A few exceptions to this rule exist, but class and racialized realities almost always accompany imperialism and colonialism, and this has been true when it comes to Christian missionary history and the way Matthew 28, 16 through 20 has been used all over the world for the justification of violence. At this point, I want to read a quote by African-American novelist and essayist James Baldwin. It is a quote that provokes fear and trembling in me only the way the holiest of holies can do. From his essay, The Fire Next Time. In the realm of power, Christianity has operated with an unmitigated arrogance and cruelty Necessarily, since a religion ordinarily imposes on those who have discovered the true faith, the spiritual duty of liberating the infidels. The Christian church itself, again as distinguished from some of its ministers, sanctified and rejoices in the conquests of the flag and encouraged, if not, if not did not formulate, the belief that conquest, with the resulting relative well-being, of the Western population was proof of the favor of God. It is not too much to say that whoever wishes to become a truly moral human being, and let us not ask whether this is possible, I think we must believe it is possible, must first divorce himself from all the prohibitions, crimes, and hypocrisies of the Christian church if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him. To invoke a spiritual question made famous by another spiritually profound man, a white Protestant author and teacher, Wayne Mueller, how then shall we live? This Bible is our book. We can no more abandon this book than we can abandon the blood flowing through our veins. Whether we like it or not, it's here and it's not going anywhere and it's full of the stuff that gives us meaning and value and, and it is so full of stuff that we cannot live with in good conscience. Both of those things are true. How then shall we live with this passage this morning? For those of us who find comfort in conflict avoidance. There is a tendency, much like the one I named when I started this sermon, calling myself out, there is a tendency to flee, to avoid, to look the other way, to read something else, to preach something else. But when it comes to relationship, and that's what we have with our sacred text, relationship, relationship requires engagement. And I see a lot of similarity here with what we do when it comes to dysfunction in our families or in our workplace. We pretend like it's all okay, like if we don't look at it or we don't name it, then it's all going to go away. But here's the thing, it never goes away. Histories of trauma and pain sit and they fester and they scream for healing and liberation until we can no longer avoid them. I think, therefore, the most faithful step is in toward, closer, a more intimate, vulnerable way of seeing and of being in relationship, one that takes little details and larger pictures into account, one that requires patience, endurance, and commitment on our parts, one that refuses silly answers and begs for deeper questions about ourselves and about who and what we find ourselves in relationship to or with. Are you with me? 
Can we go deeper into this? There's three people in here that are with me. Are you all with me? Yes. All right. All right. So here are then some details and some abstractions and deeper questions, a more intimate engagement with this text. But I want us to hear it one more time out loud. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you to the end of the age. First, a translation issue that sheds light on the social context from which this text emerges. In verse 19, the word nations, and if you have your Bibles, you can open them and check this out. The word nations is an English translation that can also be translated as Gentiles. Okay? The Greek word ethne, from which we get ethnicity, ethne, is used here. And again, it could translate to either nations or Gentiles. There is very little consensus from biblical scholars about which is the more accurate translation, which actually makes a lot of sense. At the time of Matthew's gospel, the spiritual community inaugurated by Jesus from six, some 50 to 60 years earlier, formerly known as the Way, was having an identity crisis. And you can feel this crisis throughout the gospel of Matthew if you have eyes for it. The community was trying to figure out its internal and external relationships to Judaism and to Gentiles. Jesus was a self-identified, ritually observant Jew who was constantly calling others, both Jewish and Gentile, to the piety and morality made known in the Torah. He was considered the Messiah, the fulfillment of Israel's hope, a thoroughly Jewish term and religious concept by those who followed him and all of his disciples were Jews. And yet, throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus' biggest detractors were Jewish authorities. Again, Matthew is writing 50 to 60 years after Jesus' death. And at that time, Jews and Jewish Christians were differentiating themselves in major ways. Part of that was because Jewish Christians held Jesus as the Messiah, which non-Christian Jews did not. But also because the people most rapidly joining the soon-to-be Christian community were Gentiles people of Greco-Roman culture and practice, many who were proud citizens of the occupying force Rome and had been considered the enemy and the outsiders by Israel for a long time. Gentiles were converting to Christianity all over the place, mostly as a result of Paul's mission beyond Jerusalem. And whenever a large group of converts begin converting, the original group inevitably changes in identity, language, and behavior. So when the word nations and the word Gentiles show up in our text, inseparable from each other, all of this struggle around identity is present. How a book closes is of high importance. If the final words of Matthew's gospel beckon disciples to go make disciples of all nations or all Gentiles, and yet Jesus' earlier commandment for disciple, di discipleship in Matthew 10 says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, what does that tell us about where the early church found itself after Jesus had been gone for a while? It seems to me that the issues of internal division or contested identity were at play from the very beginning. And that's comforting to me as someone who can barely identify or find common ground with some of my fellow Christians upon this earth today. But moving a little further, Jesus's, uh, Matthew's Jesus advises his followers to use baptism as the ritual or symbol of conversion. We tend to envision baptism as a ritual of initiation in this church, an initiation into certain commitments, a certain way of life. But back then, baptism was becoming the Christian alternative to Jewish circumcision as the mark of differentiation between insiders and outsiders. 
Matthew's Jesus is suggesting that the disciples do the work of marking themselves insiders in chapter 28, verse 19. So by this point, I imagine some of you are wondering, so what? What does this have to do with me? Um, I think it has to do with us, with something that I see Christianity wrestling with in its beginnings and something I see Christianity wrestling with today and honestly something I see humanity wrestling with in an eternal kind of way. Part of what it means to be human, I believe, is to wrestle with issues of identity in community, with issues of insiders versus outsiders. And some humans, including many members of our tradition, have entered into this wrestling match through the work of conversion. Instead of using our internal diversities and complexities as the springboard for curiosity and compassion, relationships and the celebration of what incarnates among us through difference, many of us have gone out to try to make more of them like us. In short, we avoid our differences by trying to create more of the same. And the results have been disastrous. I am and I am not sorry that I cannot redeem this text for myself or for you or for us. But in light of who we are today, in light of the history of imperialism, in light of the history we inherit when reading this text, I must ask that we don't try to make the messiness, the complexity of this disappear. In fact, I want us to linger and swim here until we get new muscles for remaining and abiding in the wrestling with what it means to be human, what it means to be Bible-reading progressive Christians, what it means to live with the facts of difference both in ourselves and in our world without trying to abolish it in ourselves or in others. And in conclusion, I want to return to James Baldwin's quote and swap the word God with the word conversion and see where it leaves us. If the concept of conversion has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If conversion cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of it. Sometimes I think we should get rid of the concept of conversion altogether. But then again, maybe there's still some room for it, just in a different place and space than before. The only kind of conversion that I see making us larger, freer, and more loving is the conversion from cultural arrogance to spiritual humility. As Christians in the 21st century, that conversion work isn't about going out there and doing to others. It's right here within us, punctuated by a promise of divine presence. Remember, I am with you always. Amen.